Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, this session is uh, titled Commissioning HVAC Systems for Sustainable Indoor Air Quality. Um, you're going to have myself, Eric Malmstrom, the CEO of Safe Traces, and then Jeffrey Michael from uh, SETI and Associates co presenting. So, just to, to kick off here, um, the learning objectives for this session are one, to uh, recognize steps for sustainable indoor air quality commissioning for existing buildings. Secondly, um, to talk about how we can integrate emerging technologies and commissioning approaches into traditional commissioning practice. Third, um, to, to strengthen the ability to do accurate field measurement and verification, specifically on both IAQ and energy efficiency. And then fourth, uh, to talk about how we can look at uh, other indoor air quality strategies beyond the kind of uh, traditional focus on increasing outdoor air levels, which obviously have a direct tension with energy efficiency. So more on that in a second. Uh, I'm just going to have uh, Jeffrey come up and briefly introduce himself and SETI, and then I'll, I'll come back. Uh, hey, good morning. Uh, Jeffrey Michael, SETI and Associates. Um, we are headquartered in Washington, D.C., um, and we are pretty traditional MEP. Uh, FP firm, uh, been doing commissioning work for about 13 years, um, and I'll be presenting with Eric today. Great. Thanks, Jeffrey. And uh, I'm the CEO of Safe Traces. So Safe Traces is a California-based biotech company that offers a biotech-enabled uh, commissioning and verification service for measuring and verifying HVAC uh, system performance and also air cleaners for optimizing indoor air quality and energy efficiency. And uh, we work very closely with Jeffrey and, and SETI, but also a number of other kind of commissioning service firms, test and balance, and other engineering service firms. So uh, just to set up today's discussion, uh, we want to talk about kind of some of the, the conventional thinking on indoor air quality. So about this time last year, the EPA and the White House uh, launched something called the Clean Air in Buildings Challenge, which is very much coming on the heels of the pandemic. And obviously, over the past few years, there's been a lot of focus on indoor air quality with us having a very uh, infectious respiratory disease spreading around. And, um, and that now we're starting to see, after the immediate emergency, emergency response to COVID, like uh, both from a policy and a regulatory and standards perspective, things are now becoming much more embedded um, into the ongoing way that we're looking at uh, operating buildings. And uh, the Clean Air and Buildings Challenge is kind of official guidance coming from, from the White House, the EPA, with also the CDC involved, which comes up with a four-step kind of recommended set, uh, four recommended steps. Starting with number one, come up with a clean uh, indoor air plan for your building, focused on assessing IAQ and planning upgrades and improvements. And I, I love that. Number two, though, it immediately jumps to optimize fresh air ventilation by bringing in and circulating clean outdoor air indoors. So the, the question and kind of the point of departure for our presentation today is, number one, is that the right approach? How do we know, you know, number one, uh, we, we know that that is going to come with a cost and energy price tag, which we will get into. But also, is that the best way to um, improve indoor air quality in a building? And the, the answer is, you know, in many cases, and, and our data will kind of show this amongst other data, it, it is not the best approach that we have at our disposal. And there are lots of other things we can do before increasing outdoor air ventilation right off the bat. And just to kind of put a sharper point on it, this is a quote from one of our uh, technical advisors at Safe Traces, Dr. Bill Bonfleth at Penn State, who's a former ASHRAE president and currently chair of the ASHRAE Standard 241P Committee, which is a, a new standard that ASHRAE will uh, release in June for indoor air quality pathogen mitigation. And he kind of uh, summarizes the challenge that we have, which is, to create high indoor air quality, low energy, climate resilient buildings for the future, 
We need to embrace alternatives to out, outside air ventilation to maintain healthy indoor air environments. Ultimately, IAQ and energy efficiency is not either or, it's and. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to Jeffrey here to talk through kind of from an engineering standpoint some of the trade-offs that we have. Uh, thanks, Eric. Um, so as Eric kind of laid the groundwork, um, we understand there's a direct correlation between uh, more outside air and cost, obviously, right? Um, we're in Texas today, pretty warm climate. Um, I'm in Atlanta, pretty warm, humid climate. Um, there's an extraordinary cost uh, to bringing more outdoor air into a building in the name of mitigating viral transfer. So to Eric's point, is it the right approach? Um, does bringing in more outside air reduce the risk of transmitting virus or pathogens or anything like that uh, from, from one person to the other? Um, or is it a bit, bit of fallacy? So before we get to the fallacy part, we'll talk about the energy part. Um, so in these graphs, obviously, depending on uh, your geographic location, um, you know that uh, outside air, whether you're an office, a school, a hospital, um, is uh, directly impacts your energy consumption, directly impacts your cost profile or your client's cost profile. So as commissioning agents um, working for a building owner, advising them on how they might improve their indoor air quality, uh, simply driving outside air up probably isn't the right solution. It needs to be balanced with proof. It needs to be balanced with uh, some institute testing that suggests that the driving of that outside air actually um, reduces the or re reduces the risk of transferring the virus, right? Um, so Eric will get into that a little later. Um, if you're in this room for the session prior, you also may have learned a little bit about filtration. Um, one of the other um, more common uh, reactions that we saw during COVID was that uh, it, not just outside air, but also improving filtration in your equipment, right, uh, should reduce your risk. Um, well, that also comes at an energy cost. Um, and so to what extent does filtration actually help your virus mitigation or your indoor air quality? Um, and what is the energy penalty, right? What is the cost penalty for doing such a thing, right? The costs are are bound up in not just the cost for the energy, but the cost for the filters themselves. And then at what point do the more expensive filters become less available, right? Because the demand rises. Um, so I think as commissioning agents where our role is to educate a building owner or a building operator on the systems that they have and the decisions that they're making, right? Um, we really need to educate them on all components, right? Of those decisions, not just the fact that they want to improve their indoor air quality, but um, what are their ongoing day-to-day -day impacts of doing such a thing, right, in order for them to make the right decision? So, so just beyond this topic being generally important to um, people's health and safety and to energy efficiency, I'd say that we are in, in flight from going from a world of best practice and guidelines to the regulatory hammer dropping. And it's already dropping on energy efficiency and decarbonization. We're seeing uh, code mandated requirements to reduce energy and carbon at the federal level. And in December, there was a federal building performance standard that was announced. And then at the sub-federal level in many states and municipalities ranging from New York City, which has local law 97, California, where we're based, that has Title 24, you're seeing a lot of uh, code requirements for reducing energy consumption by 30% by 2030. And that uh, is something that commercial buildings above a certain square footage are subject to. And, and Given that we're at CX, CX Energy, many of you are very familiar with those, those code requirements and people are scrambling now to, um, to, to become compliant or to prepare to be compliant. Interestingly, indoor air quality and pathogen mit mitigation is going from what I would describe as the wor a, a little bit of a fluffy, amorphous world where we have things like ASHRAE uh, 62.1 and 62.2. Um, also in healthcare, there's uh, ASHRAE 170 where this is much more real. But we're seeing that indoor air quality and pathogen mitigation is also 
becoming, or the hammer starting to drop as well. And as I mentioned, ASHRAE is currently developing um, this new standard 241P, which is focused on IAQ and pathogen mitigation, um, which will be a consensus-based code enforceable standard that is scheduled to be uh, released in June next month. And what uh, ASHRAE has said about this is that this standard is going to include both design and operation, which I think is really important because aside from this just being a design requirement, there's going to be ongoing requirements in existing buildings. Um, secondly, there are going to be alternative pathways to achieve um, equivalent clean air, so not just increasing outdoor air levels, but um, giving credit for things like filtration and disinfection via UV and other technologies. And then also testing, verification, commissioning, and ongoing commissioning requirements, which obviously impacts all of you, and that um, there's going to be a big opportunity with this new, new standard coming. So finally, um, beyond just the, the code, code kind of uh, and standard uh, requirements and opportunity that that creates, there's also just a real dollar and cents impact of all this stuff. So, you know, uh, at a macro level, we've seen interest rates, you know, shoot up over the past several months. And then also the cost of energy has gone up. So this, uh, the, the way that you're operating the HVAC system is not only important for IAQ and energy efficiency, it really impacts the kind of cost basis of how people are running buildings. And obviously everyone is trying to manage cost right now, whether you're in commercial real estate and you're taking a heavy hit in many cases, or you're running schools or healthcare facilities or other types of buildings that need to manage energy and cost around the HVAC system operation. So, you know, there's a real business case for this, and um, that's all set up for now. W what do we do about it? So I'm going to turn it over to Jeffrey to talk through um, the opportunity here on how you commission HVAC systems for sustainable IAQ. All right, so um, the way we're going to kind of talk through this on the front end is um, kind of think about our traditional commissioning approach, right, whether it's a, n a new building um, or existing construction, right, whether you're uh, retro commissioning or you're continuous commissioning or ongoing commissioning, however you want to phrase it, right. Um, so I've kind of broken it down into these different phases. You're planning, you're assessing, you're continuing, right? Um, and, and the way I see it is that the commissioning world is kind of evolving a bit right now. I think um, as energy prices rise, as the availability of equipment uh, it, it gets worse, um, as the uh, availability of resources and uh, technically skilled labor uh, gets a little thinner and spread out, right? Um, there's a, a burden on us as commissioning agents, as commissioning providers to help the owner through that, right? Through the time to manage all of these things. Um, you know, early equipment packages, uh, long lead items, right? All of this stuff. So the planning side of commissioning is, is getting very burdensome, right? Um, and how do we help owners, you know, with all that in mind, how do we help owners uh, build OPRs and bases of design and things like that that are going to accommodate all of the challenges that we know exist today that didn't exist just three or four years ago? Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, as we kind of take this sustainable IAQ approach as well, um, what does it mean now to assess, right? What does it mean to assess IAQ with respect to commissioning? Um, Eric's kind of hit on uh, the idea of this, this ongoing process, right, where um, if you're gonna if you're gonna design for indoor air quality, well, uh, as commissioning agents, we're all very accustomed to knowing that just because a building's designed a certain way doesn't mean that it's operated that way or that it even works that way, right? So how do we ensure that on the day-to-day -day occupancy level, right, that the building is operating and functioning from with IAQ in mind, right? What can we as commissioning agents do to ensure such a thing, right? Um, so when you get down to this continuing phase, right, institute testing, right, um, is really what it boils down to. Um, ongoing, real-time monitoring, right? Um, and what comes out of that is kind of some emerging technology that Eric and his company are, are on board with. And if you were in the room prior to now, um, what Attune was doing or any other um, IAQ kind of a standalone uh, sensor network, right, um, what they're promoting in their space, um, that's how we do it as commissioning agents. Um, so 
what, what I'm gonna go through in the next few slides is taking our traditional approach and trying to weave in, right, um, where this IAQ mindset comes into play, right, at what parts of our approach uh, does IAQ become relevant, right? Um, so new building or existing building, you're really looking at a risk assessment, right? Um, if you're looking at IAQ, this room is risky. Um, if outside air isn't functioning properly in this room based on CO2, then this room is risky. Um, if you're in this, if from, an, from an owner's perspective, um, if outside air is just operated at maximum all the time, this room is cost risky, right? So how do you balance the two things, right? How do you ensure that, that the, the function of this room as it was designed, right, and maybe as it was commissioned on day one, how do you ensure that on day 500, right, it's still doing that thing? Um, and so it's about assessing, right, on the very front end, which spaces are gonna get loaded, when, by who, right? Um, is it a school, is it K-12, is it kids? Are they incubating this, this IAQ, right, and, and spreading it around, right? Um, so what kind of space is it? Um, how might it play into IAQ? Um, you know, ordinarily we might see some energy modeling, not really part of this discussion, um, but then you wanna maybe consider what are the indoor air contaminants, right? Um, some of the IAQ work I've done recently might find that um, there's a lot of chlorine in the airstream for some reason, right? Well, maybe it's because the outside air intake's right next to a cooling tower, right? That has a bunch of water treatment, right? So is more outside air better? Not always, right? If any of you live in California, um, or if you live in Georgia where I live, there's certain times of year, whether it's fire season or whether there's pollen on the trees, we're bringing in a bunch of other outside air isn't always the best case, right? Um, but how do you demonstrate that back to an owner, right? How do you demonstrate um, that the system is functioning, that your indoor air quality is sustainable? How do you demonstrate that back to an owner with something tangible, right? Um, so, from an IAQ perspective, it does start with kind of the checklist approach. It does start with some testing on the front end, right, as it, that we are all very familiar with, testing sequences of operations, right, a functional tests, pre-functional checklist, the whole, the whole spiel, right, of what we do as, as commissioning professionals, right? It starts there, but where it goes after that is what do we do afterwards when that building is occupied, right? How do we design certain technologies either at the front end of a project during construction, whether that's with a BAS system that may go into place, um, you know, or, or even with an existing building, a building like this, how do you retroactively come into a building like this, right, and address indoor air quality? And so really what it boils down to is emerging technology from some of these companies that are at this conference, right? Um, it, you know, if Siemens were in here, or if, if, if there was anybody else, if there was other, any other BAS vendor, right, in here, right, they've all been able to monitor indoor air quality for a very long time, right? But we all recognize the challenges of suggesting such a thing to an owner, right? Um, you know, take this BAS vendor that you already are, is a struggle to work with and give them more work to do, right? Give them more ownership of your building and of your indoor air quality, right? Well, what can other emerging technology outside of those people help us do, right? Help us generate the results that a building owner may be looking for. Um, and the way I see it, I kind of hit it early, right, was that our role really is evolving right now, right? Um, uh, commissioning's been around for a long time, right? Um, it's, and its parameters are very clearly stated, right? Um, only now would I say that OPRs are becoming more prevalent, right? Um, and beyond more prevalent, they're becoming more timely. We're not writing an OPR at CDs anymore, right? I think we're finding that OPRs are actually on the front end of the project when concepts are still being discussed, right? So I think there is um, uh, you know, some, some reconciling of where our role is, right? I think the other thing that's changing is that owners are starting to identify with what commissioning professionals can provide them through the duration right, not just during construction, right, how can, how can CX professionals help owners, right, help operators uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, right, and not just during construction to make sure the checklists are done and that lead is happy, right. Um, so 
for IAQ, for sustainable IAQ, what it really comes down to is realigning, right, and operationalizing some of your, some of our IAQ techniques, right, with our commissioning process. And so what you see on the screen here are some grabs of various technologies, right, whether it's um, on the left-hand side, you'll see uh, those dashboards come from um, Attune, the folks that were in here earlier today, um, and it is uh, IAQ sensor packs, right? hanging on a wall of a K-12 school where in real time they are monitoring indoor air quality, right? Um, so how, how is that actionable to a K-12 school? Well, maybe it tells them that uh, their filters have failed, right? Maybe it tells them that that, uh, that PIU that's supposed to have an operational fan and a filter in it, uh, the fan's no longer working or it's not moving air as frequently as it should, right? Um, one of the other things that we see from this ongoing um, indoor air quality uh, assessment is that um, various, uh, various HVAC system types, uh, whether it's a, a central zone air handler um, or it's uh, you know, various terminal equipment in the space, right, that um, equipment that has fans that continue to run generally uh, has far better indoor air quality than, uh, than terminal equipment that starts and stops. Right, so is, what is that? Is that just continuous flow of air, continuously being filtered, right? Um, and so, you know, helping owners identify where their weak points are in their building is really what it's all about, right? Because this building, for instance, is full of various system types, right? Uh, there's not one common system in this building, right? So where are the weak points for indoor air quality? Um, and, you know, whether other emerging technologies like digital twins that are telling you that equipment is getting ready to fail before it fails, um, or, uh, again, um, it, what you see in the, the top floor plan, right, is what does in indoor air quality look like from space to space? How is it varying from space to space on a daily basis? And if it's varying, right, if you're starting to see high levels of particulate matter on the same floor from one space to the next, or are they part of the same zone from a system? Or are they on different zones? Are they on different systems, right? And so maybe that's how you begin to identify which systems are struggling to keep up with indoor air quality because you've helped an owner deploy a standalone IAQ system. Um, likewise, um, you know, it, what you see in the lower left-hand picture, right, is how industrial hygienists, right, um, uh, for years have tried to resolve indoor air quality issues, right? It's that, that single day that they walk in there with that handheld device um, and they're measuring indoor air quality. They're looking at particulate matter, right? Well, what happens when we start to do that minute by minute, hour by hour, and on a daily basis, right? How does that, how does that change our perspective on where systems are working and where they're not working? I know that as a commissioning agent, if I just go read the tab report, I'm only gonna get a snapshot, right? I'm only gonna get a, a minute in time, right? I know that the only way that I'm going to learn anything about how my building is behaving is if I study trends, right? So why should indoor air quality be any different, right? Um, you really need to stand up an ongoing routine process that assesses your indoor air quality. Um, and that's where Eric's gonna start to pick back up, talking about how we together um, have implemented various techniques, right, to, to assess indoor air quality and maintain indoor air quality. And the intent is that any one of these things uh, doesn't hold a lot of merit on its own, frankly, right? Um, I think what's really important to say is that just like if I were to opening your commission or open your commissioning tool belt now, I would find, you know, some temperature sensors. I might find some airflow hoods. I might find some uh, some ammeters. You know, I might find various instrumentation, right, that you use to validate that your building is functioning well. And I think that we need to be looking at our building telemetry, our building systems, our indoor air quality devices, uh, BAS systems, whatever it may be, the same way, right? That there is emerging tech out there that is a tool for us, and we need to find ways for owners to understand how those tools can be deployed to benefit their buildings, their portfolio.
All right, so great, great overview from kind of commissioning practice and process um, to also how you weave in new technologies. So where uh, Safe Traces comes in is just to give you a quick overview of, of our technology. So we've developed a, um, an aerosol tracing technology where we take uh, water and then we use kind of safe um, DNA tags um, that, that go into the water solution, and we use it to uh, develop a, a challenge agent for the HVAC system and for air cleaners that's safe, that can be um, sprayed and released in, in buildings, in occupied buildings. And what you're doing is you're trying to uh, simulate a respiratory emission of a person who's sick. And so, you know, it's in, you spray simulating a cough or sneeze, and then you use the DNA tag to track how long it takes to clear a room, how are the particles spreading around a space, and whether they're staying contained locally or they're leaking out of spaces. Um, and all of this is intended to give you uh, high-quality, accurate, real-world data to then measure and verify in situ in a real-world building um, depending on the building design and the, the HVAC system design and then the way it's operated, where those particles, you know, are they getting onto surfaces? What impact does increasing the outdoor air rate have um, on removing these particles? What impact does putting a higher MERV rating uh, filter on your air handling unit do? What happens when you put in in-room HEPA unit and, and soon we'll be able to um, validate in the field UV technologies. Um, the, the, the results that you generate from this process is kind of giving you from more of a EHS standpoint, what's the potential dose exposure level um, to, uh, to, to viruses? If you have sick people in different parts of the building, how exposed will that, per, how, will, how exposed will those people, people be? But then in more kind of traditional engineering type metrics, being able to convert our numbers into equivalent air change rates, being able to match up our data with airflow, air distribution, air balance data, you know, being able to measure kind of leakage rates, and then also being able to visualize this in heat maps and easily understandable kind of um, graphics, so you kind of demystify what's actually happening in the air. The process, just high level, is we start with a desktop audit, so we say based on the building design and, and operations, how should a building be performing? And we use things like ASHRAE's equivalent air change calculator to get kind of a quick read on where we think the building is performing. But then, importantly, we know design does not equal performance, and so we want to go and test against that. And that's where our technology is used in the course of retro commissioning, ongoing commissioning, where we're doing these, this field measurement and verification using controlled releases of aerosol tracers and spaces to then get to the, the ground reality of what's happening in a building. Um, that field uh, measurement and verification generates high-quality field data to help you understand uh, performance and then optimize. So for deficient areas, being able to identify those and then say, here's what we think is going on and here's how you can, uh, you know, remediate it or some, some type of corrective action that can improve the performance. Also, another common problem is buildings are often overventilating and overfiltering. So when we see, you know, overperformance, then the question is to the, the owner, do you want to be there or do you want to dial it back a little bit and realize cost and energy savings? Um, and so then, you know, having data makes that a, a much more concrete and tangible discussion. But then finally, step four is ongoing recurring uh, field verification. So not doing kind of one and done testing, but having annual or seasonal performance evaluations that are happening, you know, uh, constantly within buildings to understand this and not to just have one snapshot. So now, just in our uh, remaining time, we're going to talk about case studies of what does this look like in different types of buildings, and really uh, bringing to life kind of what is the value of more of a technology-enabled approach to commissioning to then yield uh, insights and value ultimately back to the owner. So let's start off with K-12. So K-12 is has been a very active area over the past few years because of all the ESSER funding and federal and state money that's been provided for 
um, schools to respond to COVID. And a lot of that money has been specifically um, geared towards facility improvements and HVAC improvements. So in this uh, instance, the case study we're showing, which uh, Jeffrey and, and SETI and Safe Traces worked on collaboratively, uh, we were working with Atlanta Public Schools, major school district, um, roughly 100 buildings across the district, and uh, Atlanta Public Schools wanted to retro commission their HVAC systems and then also make decisions about supplementary air cleaners across the district. Um, a APS is unique in that they have 100% um, commissioning and test and balance program already in place. They love data. They're very serious about kind of preventative maintenance and, and system optimization. And so we were able in, 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 uh, in the district to help work with the leadership and then the frontline facility managers to go across several schools and um, go into classrooms, go into cafeterias, go into the kind of staff areas and in principal office and so forth and do testing in different schools to say, if you had a sick person in, in a classroom in a given school, how long would it take for that classroom to clear? And, um, and what you see on the graph, which may be a little bit hard to see, is we have um, four different schools kind of benchmarked against each other. And you see across a half hour when we release tracers, how long did it take for those uh, classrooms to get the particulate out of the air? And if you go to the, the 22 and a half to 30 minute interval, you'll see two, two schools uh, were able to clear 100% of the particles out of the air. We were getting limit of detection readings, but then two other schools uh, were getting more kind of 60% type clearance levels. And so then the question is, what is that data telling us? So we see kind of um, in one school that, uh, you know, the two schools that achieved 100%, they performed strongly. That those were recently renovated schools um, that were able to validate that their capital improvements actually worked. So great news. Uh, for two of the underperforming schools, we found that there were system deficiencies. So in one case, it was a more serious system deficiency that then became prioritized for capital improvement. But in the other instance, it under performed because of simple, you know, operational fixes of fixing damper positions, opening doors, you know, low hanging fruit type things that they were able to do immediately without a price tag and that immediately made the classroom environment safer. So, you know, uh, each time we test, the data is telling us a story that then kind of uh, jives back to practical actions that the school district can take to kind of prove things across a district. So doing this not just in one school one time, but doing it across lots of schools on an ongoing basis. I'm gonna turn it over to Jeffrey, who is kind of running point on this to share his perspective. Yeah, um, <clears throat> so as I was talking about, you know, lots of tools in the tool belt, right? Um, the work that we did together, right, was, was part of the, the APS's program to find the most practical and most equitable way to spend the ESSER funds that they had. Um, you know, they could have taken the money and gone to, you know, 10 of the 100 schools and just done improvements, right? Replaced systems, uh, the, had renovations, right? Uh, turned it into a pretty school that hadn't been touched in 40 years. But they didn't want to do that. They wanted it to be equitable. They didn't want the, in, in un, understandably, right, the scrutiny that came from where those ESSER funds went for a lot of people was pretty heavy, right? Um, so for APS specifically is how do we make it equitable? Um, and, and how do we make an impact, right? So we tested um, lots of things. Um, we tested needlepoint, we tested HEPA in-room filters, we tested increased filtration on terminal equipment, we tested a 50% uh, increase in outside air fraction, and we tested them all side by side in those same four schools in four different classrooms, right? So 16 data points in, um, across the portfolio, right? And we tested it for 90 days in the year prior. Um, and what was very clear to us was that in-room HEPA filtration performs very well, that those those air cleaners, when sized for specific air changes in a space, perform very, very well based on what our indoor air quality sensors hanging on the wall were telling us, right? So then APS buys in, they order 5,000 of these pieces of equipment. We have a massive effort to roll out 5,000 HEPA cleaners. Um, 
pre-purchase replacement filters, replacement UV lamps, use these ESSER funds, basically maximize these ESSER funds to the best of their ability to ensure ongoing this operation in perpetuity, right? So then post-project or post-install or rollout of these HEPA room cleaners, working with Safe Traces to come in and validate that in different rooms across different schools that these HEPA cleaners are actually still doing the job we think that they're doing, right? Um, and so while not demonstrated on this chart specifically, um, we saw a twofold impact of aerosol removal from those HEPA filters, right? So as you see the trend of time in this graph, of time and aerosol removal, right, which is what that graph represents, um, you would see that graph effectively cut in half or all of those things that are getting to 100% in 30 minutes, getting to 100% in, 50, in 15 minutes instead, right? Um, so again, um, it's a tool in the tool belt, right? And there's a lot of them. Um, and it's, I think we as CX professionals have that responsibility to bring this technology, right? To bring some of these devices, these approaches to our owners that we represent, right? To ensure that they get the product that they want. And just to close out the school discussion, I mean, a, a couple of things to just mention. So right now, where a lot of schools are is they are, they've moved on from the, the COVID, but now the question is for these air cleaners that they bought, which have ongoing kind of filter costs and other costs, do we keep them? Do we just put them in the closet and bring them back for the next pandemic? What, what, what are we doing with these things? They're noisy, you know, it disrupts the classroom, learning environment. And so now, you know, we're in this kind of long, long game of figuring out with schools who took a variety of measures for COVID, are they gonna keep doing the things they've been doing the past couple years or can they safely dial it down? And then one other thing to call out is that uh, a lot of ESSER funds are expiring over the next year, and so schools still are, uh, the data indicates, have a lot of money, and they're trying to use that money before it expires, and so it can be used for equipment purchases, it can be used for testing, so there's a, a really great opportunity. And then there's new money coming online at both the federal and then the state level for various grant programs through the Department of Energy and then elsewhere to help uh, improve uh, health and then energy efficiency in schools. So this is a very active area, as I mentioned, and still a lot of opportunity. So the next couple uh, case studies, just to, to kind of go through how else can these new technologies like ours and others be employed. So let's go to a very different type of environment, healthcare and long-term care. So um, healthcare and long-term care are uh, environments that have, well, healthcare in particular, have uh, higher compliance standards and things like ASHRAE 170, Joint Commission requirements and so forth. And then long-term care, which is technically not healthcare, has a very vulnerable um, population within those facilities, elderly people who are very vulnerable to, to respiratory disease. And so over the past few years and in, in moving um, into the future, there's a lot of um, attention on how do we protect people in these types of environments. And so what we did in, in, in this case study was work with a long-term care facility in Wisconsin with uh, 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 commissioning, commissioning partner, so AEI, um, and we went in and retro commissioned um, HVAC systems, local HEPAs, and physical barriers in the kind of resident and common areas. Um, and then also you can extend this to in hospitals, places like negative pressure rooms and airborne isolation infection rooms, surgical suites to test pressure controls, to test you know whether you're getting the air changes that you uh, want want to achieve or need to achieve, and then also vulnerable areas of assembly where the risk of one sick person spreading it to others is is high. And so in this case, in the w Wisconsin long-term care facility, we um, they were. Uh, developing a certain area of their uh, facility portfolio that was going to be kind of a quarantine and isolation area. And we did various performance tests, you know, this time a little bit more focused on containing the spread of, of particles. And we found that um, standalone HEPA units uh, that uh, were able to create negative pressure and then also uh, prevent recirculation of contaminated air. And then also in, in certain instances, physical barriers that were put in between common and staff areas um, were, were able to 
isolate air um, in some instances between the resident rooms, so not always. But you know, some of this stuff is kind of intuitive, but then you only really know the, the effectiveness of each of these engineering controls and measures when you get, it, get into a facility and start testing. And so you, know, you can see lots of applications of this type of testing beyond healthcare, you know, clean rooms, uh, pharmacy clean rooms, and, and other kind of life science type facilities often have USP, ISO requirements, um, where they need to uh, performance test some of these things, and these new technologies are giving us a much more effective way of understanding, you know, what, what's going on on the ground. So now, I'm going to get into more of the, we've talked a lot about indoor air quality, so where does the energy efficiency piece of this come in as well? So. Moving into industrial facilities and warehouses. So um, Safe Traces has worked with a number of large kind of Fortune 100 companies who are more um, industrial manufacturing oriented. And often we are in facilities that are several hundred thousand square feet, sometimes over a million square feet, and where they have high ceilings. They're, um, uh, they have some areas where it's more uh, highly dense are more densely occupied um, and more reflective of office environments. But in other cases, you have 40-foot ceiling areas with fans and so forth. And in, in these instances, you cannot just crank up the outdoor air and slap on a MERV 13 filter and call it a day and say, we're good, we have air quality. You know, that comes at a tremendous cost. Um, and so in this instance, we are working with a, a large uh, Fortune 100 company who has dozens, hundreds actually, of warehouses, and they wanted to understand how can we create a safe environment for the people working in those facilities, but also manage the cost and energy efficiency um, across their portfolio. And so what we did was we worked across several facilities, and we were most concerned about training in conference rooms, break rooms. They had um, in their facilities ambulatory care and kind of more medical-focused areas of the facility. And they wanted to understand if we are uh, running our system at 50% outdoor air, MERV 13 filters on rooftop units versus what they had been doing pre-COVID, what was the particle removal benefit and you know, reducing exposure to infectious particles? And what we found was pretty interesting. When you increased outdoor air and then fan speed and filter efficiency, often we found not much of a difference between what they were doing pre-COVID and then doing all these other things. And um, we, we, you know, that was important because obviously uh, they, by, by running the system at these higher levels, they wanted to create a safe environment, they wanted to be compliant and so forth, but then they had to look at the long game of how are they gonna manage cost energy, you know, the service and maintenance implications of running the, the, their systems at these higher levels. And, um, and then also they were considering things like local HEPA units. And, you know, on that, in these types of facilities, it's not cheap to put HEPA units throughout these facilities. And especially given the size of the facilities themselves and how many of them they had, you're talking about tens of millions of dollars potentially of putting in HEPAs. So, you know, we were, through our, our testing, we were able to help them be more targeted and surgical about when they were gonna, you know, which engineering controls they were gonna use, how and when and where they were gonna use them. And at the end of the day, uh, the, according to their analysis, th through our testing, based on where they were running their buildings before our testing and after, they were able to realize a $50 million annual cost savings and 80 million kilowatt hours of energy savings by being able to figure out how do they optimize their facilities and using data to guide that process rather than operating in the dark. Now. In addition to our performance testing, we also run an energy model on a facility both before and after we test, which says, you know, um, if you're running the system at 50% outdoor air and we could, you know, safely demonstrate you could go back to the code minimum or drop it down from 50 to 30 to 20, you know, what would that mean in terms of dollars, kilowatt hours, and tons of carbon? And I'd say generally, we find 10 to 20 percent kind of uh, efficiency opportunity on the table in any given building. You know, in terms of what what is actually concrete the opportunity that they have if they can really understand what the 
what what the efficient way to run the building is, and then being able to then you know save some some costs and opex, being able to meet their code requirements and meet their ESG pledges for. Um, for, for uh, decarb and net zero, and then also um, to cut their utility bill. So, you know, this is meaningful stuff right now, especially in this type of economy. You know, everyone is trying to save money. Um, and, uh, and so the value of running your HVAC system more optimally is not only important for IAQ, it's also uh, important for the hard dollars and the energy piece of it. Just one other example of this is let's go into Class A office, which, you know, in this case, it's another Fortune 100 company in New York City. They have a 2 million uh, square foot high rise, um, 40 to 50 floors, and they were uh, looking at retro commissioning their HVAC system to a, an acceptable safety level while meeting the code mandated decarbonization requirements. So in this case, in New York, there's local law 97, which is one of these decarb requirements to cut energy consumption by 30% by 2030. Uh, in this case, the client had disabled their CO2 demand controlled ventilation. Um, they were running higher efficiency filters, uh, higher, higher outdoor air levels than pre-COVID. And they had also um, taken the step last year of telling all their employees they needed to come back in. So they were not kind of on board with a remote hybrid strategy. They wanted the employees back in the office. So we went in and tested last year conference rooms, dense open office areas, gyms, cafeterias, et cetera. And we found, so the graph that you're looking at is kind of the comparison of the desktop audit. We ran the building through ASHRAE's equivalent air change calculator and said, here's a calculated value based on the building design and, um, and operations of where we think the building's equivalent air changes are. And then we're gonna test against that ourselves in representative areas. And what we found was uh, unsurprisingly, the difference between design and calculated value versus real world were two different numbers. Sometimes they were pretty close. Sometimes they were pretty far apart. So if you look at kind of floors two through seven, so the se second set of um, bars on the graph to the left, you see calculated value is 11 equivalent air changes. The actual that we picked up was 8.5. So you're talking about two and a half equivalent air change difference. In some cases, they were uh, the real world performance was better than what they uh, were expecting. So you know, at the end of the day, what was the value of this? We were able to quantify kind of the difference between design and performance. We showed that actually they uh, we uh, that running the buildings back on CO2 demand controlled ventilation was fine. It was giving you equivalent performance in terms of particle removal. And also we found big potential energy and carbon savings to support the code mandates. And you know what that looked like in this building was potentially 20% savings. So it's meaningful, it moves the needle. So this is just uh, a few illustrations of different types of facilities of kind of what are what's driving the customer, where's the value, and then ultimately what is the value of really understanding the building performance with better technology and employing an ongoing commissioning approach to, 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 to help the, the building owner optimize all the things they're trying to optimize. So now to just close out, I'm going to turn it over to Jeffrey to kind of give you some takeaways and then I'll come back to share kind of a framework that we're gonna leave you with. Um, so some key takeaways. Um, obviously, we know the markets um, have changed quite a bit um, in the past few years. They continue to evolve, right? Um, and we definitely see regulatory demands coming, uh, depending on where you are geographically, right, related to IQ, related to energy. They're all intertwined, certainly. Um, Another key takeaway, obviously, the approach to, to measuring, validating, planning, designing for IAQ, right, also evolving, right? Technologies, demands, expectations, all evolving, right? I think one thing that we certainly shouldn't forget also is that we talked a lot about IAQ being related to viral transmission and things like that. Um, there's still temperature and relative humidity, right, that are very important to IAQ, right, and, and bring about their own subset of challenges when we're not maintaining those properly. So it is very well interconnected, all of these things. Um, um, 
again, uh, we as CX professionals, right, uh, we do have a leadership role. We do have an opportunity to be a leader for an owner um, in their decision-making process, right, in their evaluation process, in their daily operation of their facilities, rather than just a building turnover, right, um, and just to suffice uh, the, the means to an end, right? Um, and again, technology, 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 right? Um, there's a lot of um, more senior faces in the room. There's a lot of uh, the other junior faces in the room too, right? Um, technology is all around us. Uh, we carry it every day, and it's only going to continue to evolve, right? Um, everyone's probably thrown around, maybe even heard like chat GPT and things like that thrown around um, in the conference, I don't know. But um, it, technology is emerging just like that, right, relative to indoor air quality, relative to maintaining your buildings and maintaining buildings for clients. Um, so key takeaways. So I, I just want to go back to where we started the discussion, the, the clean air and buildings challenge and kind of that being a, a, a sign of the conventional thinking of have an IEQ plan, step one, but step two, jack up the outdoor air and good to go, you know, maybe put on a higher efficiency filter. I would describe this, describe that is, you know, no offense, but it's kind of the, the poor man's game to IAQ. Um, we, we need to be better than that. We now have a lot of learnings over the past few years, and we also have better technology tools to help us understand and, and to not jump to that conclusion of, just increase the outdoor air and then we're good. Because number one, we know the cost and uh, the energy and cost implications of that. Number two, um, we know that that in many cases is not doing uh, what we think it, think it is. And so what uh, Safe Traces along with several other um, indoor air quality and energy efficiency tech companies uh, did last year was we co-authored a white paper um, called the, uh, the Clean First Framework. And you know, it's basically a way to help the, uh, the industry of HVAC and practitioners reframe how they think about putting indoor air quality and energy efficiency into alignment and not trade off between indoor air quality on the one hand, but then you're killing yourself on energy efficiency or vice versa. And um, I have the screenshot here up that kind of links to just a one plate, one, one slide kind of description of the model, but I encourage people to, to check this out. Um, and you know, if anyone is interested, I can forward the, the link up here and I think you have access to the slides. But where um, the commissioning world really comes into play is in step four. So step one is set targets. Step two is kind of don't jump to increase outdoor air first, but evaluate other kind of approaches um, and, and clean first, not uh, ventilate first. Step three is then supplement with ventilation um, and, and outdoor air ventilation. And step four is validate, monitor, and control. Validate is where we come in. We are a technology to help buildings validate. And you all are uh, validation professionals by commissioning and understanding what's going on in the building. And so the two things are powerful when put together. And then the monitoring comes into the sensors and all these other real-time continuous monitoring technologies like Attune, who is here um, in the, the previous presentation. And, and a number of great new uh, sensing and, and monitoring technologies that are hitting the market. And then ultimately, the validation and monitoring is only valuable insofar as you're actually controlling, you know, and, and both through the mechanical system itself and then the way the operators are running it, being able to achieve both IAQ and energy efficiency. So um, that's it. Thank you so much. Um, huge opportunity, um, just to, to close out. So we have uh, a booth here, booth 240. Um, Stephanie, our Director of Channel Partnerships, who many of you know is waving her hand over there. Please feel free to talk to her or me. Um, we work very closely with um, this community of, of service providers. And if you're interested in learning more, um, we, we'd welcome the discussion. Thanks so much. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't know, do we have Q&A now? Yeah. Okay, yes, we have Q&A, so please 
for it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the, the aerosol, like in terms of the, the particle sizes or, yep. Right. So, yep. So we um, we have a an electronic pneumatic sprayer. It's kind of like a tabletop box, and we we have the kit at our booth. But it's basically a box like here. You push a button, and it puts out five mL liquid volume of um, of of this uh, aerosol solution, and then we know the concentration of DNA copies that we're putting out in the space. And so we have kind of a calculated baseline concentration. We measure early on in a sampling interval to see after the particles have kind of distributed in a room, what is that kind of baseline level real world. And then we're measuring across time, you know, generally an hour, what is the removal rate look like? And then, we, we, you know, that's just kind of like a room clearance test. Then we also test for kind of what's getting out and we'll do what we call a survey test, which is doing, you know, simultaneous releases across a space and then sampling across a space. And we can detect uniquely for each tracer that we're introducing. So you can basically map out the airflows. It's kind of like a, an applied CFD model where you're able in a real world to, you know, like, test out kind of how air is moving around and then iteratively scenario test a space. Absolutely. And that, that, um, that in particular is exactly the type of test we do in airborne infection rooms to see are things that are negative, or like our rooms that are negatively pressured, is it getting out into the ante room? Is it getting out into the hallway in a clean room? Absolutely, yeah, and, and we can put the samplers, you know, depending on what the space type is and what you want to know, we position the samplers wherever, you know, like we can release in a room and then we put samplers up at the return and supply of an air handling unit to see what, part, what level of particulate is even getting back there. And then once for the particulate that is getting back there, what are the filters removing? And so it kind of serves the function of uh, you know, filtration, integrity testing, also like airflow and, and air distribution, so. Any other questions? Okay, great, well, feel free to talk to us up here or come by the booth and speak with me and Stephanie, thanks so much.